last week, I looked at the passage with you out of Revelation 119, and if you have a Bible like mine. <laughs> Wait a minute. Don't say you didn't tell me so. 1,560 is the page number, and if it's not, my friends, <laughs> please don't complain. Um, but it's Revelation 119 that we looked at, write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things that which shall be hereafter. And we, I took apart that to show you basically the things that John had seen, the appearing of Christ, and the things which are, which comprise these churches. And let me say a few words about these, um, the things which are, which comprise of these churches. The initial audience of this book, of these churches, is or are, or were, in that case, the churches of Asia Minor. And we know absolutely unequivocally that there were more than seven churches in Asia Minor. If you look at a map, you can see Patmos may be, the Isle of Patmos may be off, and then you begin going almost in a horseshoe to see these, these we'll call them areas in Asia Minor, beginning with Ephesus and ending with Laodicea. But these are certainly not the churches that, for example, we don't have any mention in the seven churches of the book, uh, the church of, uh, or the churches at Corinth or Colossae, even though they are comprised in that general area, we're talking about something that perhaps, let me just say first, seven churches are listed, but um, the number may be more important than the actual location. Seven, obviously, is the number of completion or perfection maybe perhaps representing the whole church body, but certainly these churches as hubs to have these messages sent to them, and of course, like everything else, these messages then become uh, distributed and passed on, and this is how we today have this book that we call the New Testament in the very same fashion. Um, so Christ is, is dictating, authoring each of these, almost in every case he gives, a commendation, there's, there's a formula to each one of these. And as I said to you, probably the most important thing, if you've not heard me teach or talk about rapture, I don't want you to think that I'm not going to talk or teach on it, but I, want it, I really want to get something clear in our brains. And that is that we've got from the second chapter through to the end of the third, we've got a repetition of the spirit speaking to the churches, to the church here, to the church there. There's great emphasis. And then after that, we don't hear any more about the church or the churches or, or the Spirit of God speaking. So it's really important to take a, a clear position that however one wishes to interpret, it must be in, interpreted by the book, and the book is very clear. Beginning in the fourth chapter, a scene begins in heaven and whether we want to call John the type of a church who is transported up into heaven, or whether we want to call John simply the one who, to whom it was revealed for him to see the things both in heaven and in earth, however you would like to formulate your thoughts on that, one thing is crystal clear, that at the close of the third chapter in the 22nd verse, we hear no more about the churches. And we know what the church, the word church, ecclesia, his outcalled ones. He said he would build his church, the key word right there, his church. And the unseen forces, what your King James calls the gates of hell, the unseen forces, Hades in the Greek, shall not prevail against it. So let's be clear about what we're dealing with. These chapters, or at least one, uh, two and three, are dealing with direct addresses with the uh, authorship being dictated by the Lord himself and what we have here, somewhat interesting, is, there is there's actually a formula. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write. Remember, John is the one being told twice, write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. And we can know that in this writing, writing down, the churches are part of what things were, things which are, as he was writing. So, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, 
who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Now let's do this. And I'm, unfortunately, I, I was going to try and do this earlier, but um, it looks like I have to do it now, and I probably will. I'm thinking sometimes in my mind this board is a lot longer, <laughs> but it's really not. Um, so let's do this. Let's put here, I'm going to do some, some short writing, Ephesus. And up here, we're going to put Christ. And so Ephesus, we're dealing with 2.1, Revelation 2.1 through 7. And the description of Christ, there'll be some abbreviation here, so bear with me. Seven stars, right hand, and the emphasis on the fact of the seven, seven golden candlesticks and the fact that he is walking. I'm going to go up here. Walking in the midst. So you've got two concepts initially describing something about Christ. Seven stars, what's the right hand scripturally or biblically? Right hand is power or authority. So, and the fact that he is walking in the midst of these seven golden candlesticks. And that, you know, I've read this so many times and never dawned on me. We're not talking about... Um, Christ sitting somewhere and looking on. He's walking in the midst, observing, seeing. And let's go this way first. We'll see. I don't think I'm going to fit this all in. So, oh boy. Squish. Commendation to this church. If you can read my English writing. Commendation to this church. I know thy works, thy labor, thy patience, Ah, I know thy works to erga. And each one of these, by the way, Christ says, I know thy works. To each one of these, I know thy works. I wish I could just put a period right there and, and just spend my whole message talking about that because I think so many times people will read this and they think, oh, of course, well, that, that's the most important thing that a church can do is works. But we're not talking about this as a verb. Christ is speaking to the churches, I know thy works as a noun. That is basically talking about everything that goes on, not works as in get out there and be busy, but what goes on. Nominally used, describing, not defining, if you will, the activities. I know thy works, thy labor, which is more probably better put as toil, and thy patience, which should read, Endurance. It's a cognate, that word, hupomeno, which is from underneath and abiding, to, to endure. So let's put down the commendation of Christ. Works, and don't, don't go works on me like, okay, do, do. Works, labor, <clears throat> endurance, and another commendation that you... These people at Ephesus cannot bear those that are evil, not bear those evil liars. They say they are apostles, but they are not. And this is, may seem very strange because I've never done this in a linear way, but it really helps to kind of put things in perspective. How thou can, canst bear them that are evil, which are evil, and as Thou hast tried them, which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. And hast borne, and hast patience, again, we're back to that same endurance, for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. So there's a, there's a commendation right there. I don't have room to write it all. Um, what I would say to you, what's probably most important about this is... As you go across, you've got the description of Christ, the commendation. You have a rebuke. A rebuke. Does your King James say, you've left your first love? Is that what it says? Left? Okay. Really, lost love. You know, when you say 
you left something, like I left my heart in San Francisco, right? This is lost love. And the Greek word for this is a word I've used many times in different messages. In fact, I've used it uh, many, many times in the message on forgiveness. The Greek word is ephikin, from ephiemi, which is usually to release. But in this particular case, it's used for abandoning or lost. And that really is very suggestive of what was going on at this church. Now, if you go back and put this all in perspective, the rebuke, lost love, even though the commendation is, I know thy works, labor, endurance, how you can't bear those that are evil, you've tried them, which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars, has borne, has patience, endurance, for my namesake has labored and is not, you've, you've not fainted. Nevertheless, so what we have here is a church that essentially is going through the motions, mechanical Christianity, if you will, of going through the motions. And I'm going to say this. This happens more often. That's why I don't want to make this, these things church ages. They can be. But I want us to glean something out of this. If the Lord had a rebuke and an admonition for this type of behavior, then it really is fitting for us to pay attention. This is not your pastor standing here saying, aha, wagging the finger at you. But anybody reading this should really, really get a grip on something. This is the early church. Remember, John is writing this. Potentially, I put this book at 96 or maybe 98, the writing of this book. We're talking about a very early church, the very place, by the way, that uh, we talk about the Apostle Paul essentially planting a church there at Ephesus. We're going to turn there in a minute and read in the book of Acts a little bit of that inception. So it's kind of bizarre that let's just say not more than 30 or 40 years, and that's really stretching it. You've got a church that's now going through the motions of activity, going through the motions, even though there is something of a commendation here to say you've tried those that say that they are apostles. What does the book of John say? Try the spirits to see if they are of God. And says much, by the way, I mean, you can glean whatever you want, but anybody who understands the Greek word of apostle is one who is sent by God. And how many times have you heard somebody say they're sent by God? They feel it. They have a mission. They've been sent. They've been called. In reality, they've been called to nowhere. That's our, you know what our biggest problem is in the body of Christ? Most of the time, we hate, I'm going to use that word, we hate the word obedience because obedience connotes, for most people, the loss of self when indeed we're supposed to die to self daily and the old man should be dying daily. We hate the word obedience because we don't even understand what it means to be obedient. And the scripture says obedience is better than sacrifice. And rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. How many times have you heard people say, or you've heard people mutter and say, I won't listen to him or to her. I'm speaking of Scots collectively. I won't listen to that. You know what that is? That's a spirit because that spirit says, I will not listen to that. I will find fault with anything she says because I do not want to be broken. Now the Bible says the meek shall inherit the earth. And the meek is not milk toast. The meek, that word, is a horse wearing bit and bridle, God who is controlling the reins and able to have taken a wild horse and made it usable and profitable. Think about that. You know, you can, you can read right past this and not realize that this early church embodies much of what we see today when people say, well, what does your church do? You know, what type of works do you, do you do? What type of projects are you into? And this is what I loathe about the, the public mindset of the church. The fact of the matter is, if you are not out there doing something and being seen, look at me, the most pharisaical thing we are told exactly not to do by Jesus, by the Lord himself in Matthew 6. And yet, people come in and that's what they bring with them. Mechanical Christianity. If you'd like to know, I, I, I vacillated on, should I preach this message to you today or should I preach the message out of John 3? You must be born again. And the reason for that, my friends, is because I believe that 
no matter what anybody says about somebody coming in and finding the Lord, the Lord finds you. And there's no other way to see or enter into that kingdom except that you be born from above by his power. There's no other way in. In John 10, I believe, he says, you come any other way, you're a thief and a robber. Don't try and even come in. People that say, well, you know, if you, if you just will to come in, if you will, whatever. And that's just a bunch of stuff. It's all it is. That's just man-made religiosity. So when I look at this linear thing right here, this catches my attention. Lost love. And we're talking about that love that was once there. We're going to go back and deal with these piece by piece. Let's go with the exhortation. So we have a description of Christ, commendation, rebuke, got to write smaller here, <laughs> exhortation, exhortation. And the exhortation, I'll do it as simple as I can. Remember, repent, boy, you're going to hate me for this, repeat, because it's the easiest way to do this. Um, there is an alternative to not heeding the exhortation, and that is the removal, the removal of the candlestick. And you need to really think hard about this. That's not only the presence of the church, that's the removal of the light, that's the removal of the presence. Just think about that. You know, we tend to read through this. I've read through this for years, and I never stopped to think about what that would mean. The alternative to not heeding the warnings here, remember, repeat, we'll come, I'm going to read these a little bit clearer. The alternative is the removal of the candlestick, and my goodness, I'm going to fit it in. That's a miracle. The reward to those who will listen, hear what the Spirit is saying, and overcome, they will eat of the tree of life. And what I think, when we line this up in a linear way, you're going to see a pattern. I'll do the second one, even though it's not my mission today to get through the second one, so you can kind of see in a linear fashion. If we were looking at the church of Smyrna, which is not my goal to get there today. If we were going to Smyrna, though, there's an exhortation. Uh, there's, there's a description of Christ, first and last, dead and alive, commendation to works, tribulation, poverty. There isn't a rebuke there. There is no rebuke there. There is an exhortation. Fear none of these things that thou shalt suffer. There is no alternative, and there is a reward to not be heard of the second death. So if you begin to look at these in a linear fashion, which we now you can anticipate what will happen, Lord willing, next week, because I don't want to try and rush through this and do this all in one fell swoop, Instead of looking at these churches and talking about a church age or what it might represent through time, I want us to look at each one, has a description of Christ. Each church has a, except for I think one is lacking commendation, uh, rebuke, exhortation, an alternative, and a reward. And if you line them up like that, you can glean some very interesting things rather than isolating them and trying to pocket one by one. You've got a description of Christ in each one of these. As I said, the commendation for each one of these is about their works. I know thy works. As if to say, the Lord, the Lord knows. Um, so let me do one thing. Let me first, before I go too far into the message, let me read a little bit of background so you can just want to put some, something historical on, on this from Bruce Pauli, Encyclopedia of the Ancient World. Um, somebody said they tried to find one of these. It's 20, I think it's 20 volumes. Uh, yeah, sure, I carry them around all the time. Uh, but um, this is a very scholarly work. I would not recommend that you get it um, unless you're like me and you like reading dictionaries and encyclopedias. Otherwise, I'll just read it to you, the whole thing. Are you ready? It's, it's new. <laughs> The site, city today, Turkish county seat, Selçuk, at the mouth of the Castraeus in the Aegean, gives you a description of where 
things are, the location, if you will. Beginning in Greek period, the oldest sediment, settlement locations in the Ephesian Bay belong to the Chalcolithic period and early Bronze Age. And if you have any interest, you can. there's some incredible websites you can just kind of uh, peruse that will give you some, if you've never been there, to give you some feel. Um, this is kind of interesting. In this book, they list several scholars have identified Ephesus with a pasa in the land of Arzawa that was conquered by the Hittite king Marcellus II in the 14th century, which is something that I mentioned in another teaching. So if you ever pay attention to the crazy names that I say, this is a name that has value for another reason somewhere else. Hold that thought. Park it. A Mycenaean grave from the same period and sporadic finds from the Artemis sanctuaries document the Mycenaean uh, outpost and the founding of Ephesus, which this book dates to about 1086 BC. So kind of interesting. Uh, but really what you'd want to know that you don't need a dictionary for is that Ephesus was home to one of the seven wonders of the world, um, the temple there, that Temple of Diana, 420 feet long, 220 feet wide, at least 60 feet high, marble colonnades covered with gold, um, the epicenter of that worship, that cult worship. And Paul walks into this culture. Uh, we find the founding, if you will, the beginning, the genesis of the Ephesian church or the church at Ephesus back there in Acts 19 and 20. And we have a little spattering of some of the things that were going on there. Let's turn there. I want to read a few things, just give a little background, then we'll go back to where we are. So Acts 19, we've got Paul, bless you, coming to the coast, to Ephesus, finding certain disciples so we can tell that there were disciples there, but not necessarily well-taught disciples. He said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? They said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost, which tells you they, hadn't, they had not received the teaching, the, we'll call it the apostolic teaching. Um, and he said unto them, Under what then were you baptized? And they said, Under John's baptism. Then said Paul, Verily, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul laid his hands upon them. The Holy Ghost came on them. They spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about 12. So it's interesting. There was a band of 12, and they had not really understood or received until Paul came and set the record straight. He went into the synagogue, spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And this continued by the space of two years. So we know that he was there for two years. And the space of two years... I'm sure a pretty nice, healthy church was planted. We also know, if you keep reading, that while Paul was there, a riot broke out. I love this. That tells you, you know, all these preachers that come and they say wherever they go, there's peace and everybody's happy and love. That's just a load of you know what. <laughs> if the same word will bring life to some and death to others, the same word will bring people to soaring heights an incredible understanding. Others will be confounded. But there always is contention. People will, are very quick to say, imagine the Apostle Paul, who was trained at the feet of Gamaliel, who had all of this, we, I believe he was quite eloquent, and yet at some places, what is this babbler? What is this babbler talking about? You know, I'm thinking, wow, <laughs> if he's described as a babbler, hmm. Okay. But a riot broke out. Uh, in verse 23, about the same time there was no st small stir about that way, speaking of the way as in what they were now referring to as Christians, 
for a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, when he called together, when, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation, said, Sirs, you know, by this craft we have our wealth. So listen, with this guy coming to town, condemning idols and all of this other stuff, he's, he must be silenced, right? Because our money's going to go down the tubes here. Pretty much that's the way it, it went down. I'm giving you the short version. And of course, there was a huge melee that broke out here. And if you keep reading into the 20th chapter, um, about the 17th verse after that melee happens, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus, called the elders of the church. So now it's pretty clear. After two years, there's some established presence of church people. We'll call them church elders. And um, we have a little bit of a pattern. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know, from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I've been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, with many tears and temptations which befell me, by the lying weight of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing and was profitable unto you, but have showed you, have taught you publicly from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks' repentance toward God, faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ, and gives, keeps going on a description of what he has essentially set as a pattern for leadership. So we know the inception of this church was rooted and grounded in the faith. We know that Timothy might have been there as an overseer, and certainly John, the writer of the scribe for the Lord in the book of Revelation, was certainly at Ephesus at well. So when we talk about this church, let's not make it sound as though it didn't have some uh, great leaders and uh, eyewitnesses to Christ who basically were at the helm. And that's probably the most important thing. Now back to my text that one needs to look at when you go linear across the uh, depiction of Christ or the description of Christ, um, these seven stars in his right hand, power of God, walking in the midst, that is he's present and present as in moving around present, with knowledge. Uh, kind of reminds me a little bit of when David was, when he penned Psalm 139, and it, there's a lot of, Thou knowest, Lord, thou knowest this, thou knowest my thoughts, thou searchest my heart, thou knowest my thoughts afar off. Thou knowest there's not a word in my tongue that, Lord, you're not aware of, you don't know. So it's interesting here, the presence of the Lord, and then the opening with, I know. The Lord has knowledge. By the way, the Lord has knowledge of we talk about the churches today. That probably is the greatest missing ingredient, I think, of many churches, is the lack of awareness that what Paul wrote about, that each man's work shall be tried to see what, of what substance it is, that should scare some of those people who get into ministry thinking this is a joyride, this is a, a merchandising money machine. It should, be, it should scare the liver out of any person who is even entertained being an ambassador for Christ, because the reality is not that a minister is held to higher standards or to, high, to a higher degree, but the conviction that comes when you preach the word of God, which is, here's the reality check. Each man, each woman will be held accountable, will give account before him. And what Paul describes in Corinthians, which is of what manner, what substance, were the works mechanical, like Ephesus, were they... Were they going through the motions? Were they just busy doing? Or was this out of a heart of love? And look at the rebuke, lost love. So how can you serve, I'm sorry, I'm just going to say it. How can you serve God if you've lost sight of the one you're serving? How, how does that work? It doesn't. It's like a marriage. You can have a marriage and you can be married. Two people can be married. And when, oh boy, hold that thought. When love is lost... You know, what, how, how does this work? Two people meet, they really like each other, they decide to get married. All right, everybody, stand on your head. <laughs> Let's get married, right? And then after you're married for about a year, two years, five years, I don't know, maybe six months, whatever the honeymoon is over, right? And the toothpaste cap and the toilet lid and uh, 
picking up bodily hairs and other things that are just so annoying about this person that you once just went, <sighs> right? Now it's like, oh my God, what have I done? Right, okay, and husbands and wives, do not be looking at each other. Right? <laughs> Keep looking at me, it's like the landing strip. Keep looking at me. But when love is lost, we're talking about where there's nothing, there's, there is nothing left. Now, some people get it back. The admonition to this, Christ, to this church from, from the Lord is, is to, to remember, to repent, and to essentially do your first works over again, to go back to square one. But for many individuals, and I'm using a human example, you know how difficult that is for anybody who's lost love, abandoned love, to get it back. I mean, the Righteous Brothers had something. They, there was a method to that song. It's gone, 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 right? You know what I'm talking about. So, you know, now put this in the spiritual realm. When the spirit of God goes out of a person, we're talking about people who grieve the spirit away, which is why Paul, in his letters, talks about it. Don't grieve the spirit away. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Does that happen? Can that happen? Yes. I do not believe in one saved, always saved. I believe that there's always a possibility and a danger. It's not, it is not that you'll wake up one day and say, have I crossed the line? Because the very fact that you're asking the question, have I crossed the line, says that the Lord is still dealing with you in whatever follies and whatever foibles you've engaged in. It's the people who wake up and have no conscious awareness of anything being wrong. And in fact, the idea of doing or being a part of anything that has to do with the Bible or church or God it becomes further and further removed until it's so far away you don't even mind being separated from it all. There's not a thought process that goes into that. There's not even a question, have I? Now, I've asked the question in my lifetime, my Christian life, have I crossed the line with God? Have I? I'm sure many of you honest ones have done the same thing, right? Yeah. Have I? That means God is still dealing with you. That's why I've told you many times. Um, when you get to that point, a word of wisdom that comes out of this, go to Psalm 51 and read what David penned right there. Against thee and thee alone have I sinned. Create in me a new heart. Wash me and cleanse me. Wash me and cleanse me from my iniquity and my sin. I shall be whole. Restore in me the joy of thy salvation. All of these things which he experienced, by the way, after that, terrible sin with Bathsheba. So there's no better prototype to look at than what he penned to get you back on track to see it must start first with you and God. You're not explaining to some brother over here or some sister over here why thus and thus. That's none of their business. That's my other pet peeve is people that come in saying, well, you're, you're all unconfessed and you're, I'm pointing back there, right there in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> I won't even, husband and wife over there. No, but you know, you, are, you have unconfessed sin in your life, and that's why things are really bad for you. Listen, you talk to God, and you let these people who come and start trying to lord it over you, let them go to hell. That's what I got to say. Because that, by the way, so you might say, well, that's, that's pretty bold. Wait, you might say, that's pretty bold. But that's where they're going for judging you, because usually the people who come who are the worst um, in making these allegations and these veiled things towards you, the, they, these people are usually the ones who have a lot of stuff going on who are not talking to God. They're busy. They are the, the quintessential stone throwers of the Bible. And they don't really care about anything except persecuting you and giving you the, um, the burning trouble in your heart, which I say is it must only come from one place, and that's the devil, because only the devil can do that. The devil comes to stir up to your memory the very things that you've cast at the foot of the cross to bring back to your memory because it's just too precious to the body of Christ to have you walk in the newness of life being aware that you're washed and cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. So, you know, let's put in perspective what's being said here, um, that when it says about these, how thou canst not bear them which are evil, has tried them, which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars. Even though this is to that church in that day, what I would say to you in this day, the message that is preached is the word of God being rightly divided, number one. Number two, it's exactly what John 
First John 4 talks about, as I said, trying the spirits because there are many false prophets gone into the world. Listen to the message. And the last thing is, do these apostles in, in, in this particular second chapter and today, your pastor, am I seeking the approval of people? Am I seeking to please men and women? Am I seeking to try and be something for you that you can approve of? Or am I seeking to be approved of God? And the answer, if you haven't been around me very long, should be self-evident, even if you haven't been around me very long. I'm not seeking your approval. If, if, the, if the church was made up of a committee, I wouldn't have lasted here, even after Dr. Scott said, this is that. I wouldn't have lasted here a day because a committee has the tendency to say, what will be the most pleasing? How can we all get along? And there's only one individual that can lead the church. And I don't care if it's a man or a woman. I don't care if it's a monkey. As long as the person is definitive in their goal, that is to teach you and to lead you in the word, not in my opinion, not in what I think, not what Melissa Scott thinks. I get tired of people saying, well, you, know, you always seem a little coarse. And I'm a little coarse because I'm tired of people coming and thinking that I am your purse napkin and duffel bag holder uh, or some valet for you. I'm a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. My goal, my responsibility, my calling is to be a servant unto him. And when I serve him, I then can serve you in the way that is designed, the way the Bible says, not the way men and women think. So another criteria here, these false apostles probably undoubtedly sought to be approved by their fellows, by the people in the congregation. And if somebody says, oh, this, I love this minister, you know, they can do no wrong. You know, they, they, whatever they do, they can do no wrong. You probably need to remove yourself from that. And I say that not as though uh, I, I'm planting seeds in your head, but you know, when people, and there's Bible for this, when people only say good and swelling words about an individual, nobody has any critique, it means probably that there's really very little God in it because when everybody seems to think, oh yeah, that person is so great. Oh yeah, so you've got to listen to this person over here. When in fact, as I've said, the word of God has this capacity to divide. It even divides within the roof of your home. How many know that's true? Your family, your friends, people closest to you, and they say, you do what every Sunday? And you give money? And you go there and you spend how long? You're seated in a place for how long? Right? That's how it works. So, all right, let me move on. Their condition, as I've said, lost love, and um, the man in the midst saw their state. And that's really what I want you to think about today. The fact that the Lord sees all this. He, he sees, and it's not as though we're just going to go through the motions and pretend he doesn't see. He sees. And so what, is, what are they told here? Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. And the key thing here is, and I, I want to not read and I want to not look at things and I want to ask you to search your heart and I'm going to search mine as I say this to you. The first day that you really began to understand God called you into his glorious kingdom not the first day of sitting in the church, the first time, and it could be that you sat in the church for 10 years before it became clear the Lord has called you. And from that time till now, has it become dull? Has it become a chore? Has it become tedious? Has it become so much effort and the joy that has gone off? And please do not raise your hand. I don't want to know. I don't want to see because I know that there's some in front of me and there's some listening to me because that's the lot of almost every believer. If you stay in the church long enough, the ebbs and flows, the excitement that first was, the riveting moments sitting in church, and you can't wait, and every word is precious to, oh, God, when is this going to be over? My stomach's rumbling. I can't wait. I've got to go pick up my kids. My car's almost out of gas. I don't know what I'm going to do. Okay, what's going to happen later? Yes, I'm back, right? <laughs> Some of you sit there like that, and it's like, whoosh, grab hold of your brain. Remember, Therefore, from whence thou art fallen, go look back to the time when coming to church and hearing the word of God 
really meant something different to you. And I'm asking you to do this for a reason, because this cannot just be words on paper. There should be something very piercing. It was piercing for me when I began to formulate my thoughts. It was piercing for me because I've looked back and I've thought to myself over the years of, of people attacking me and trying to destroy me and tear down this work, did it take some of the glow? Did it take some of the joy away? Did it, did it affect my walk? And I'm, I'm just being, I'm just putting it out there. I don't want to try and stand up here with some mask and pretend that I'm not affected. And if I'm affected, how much more are you? The things that you grapple with, where you feel the Lord has said no. He shut a door. The Lord is not doing the things that I need him to do. And suddenly that all dependency on the Lord becomes all frustration, which begins that ebbing process. So remember, from whence thou art fallen. And I'm asking you today to do the same thing. I'm not saying you've fallen. I'm not saying lost love. I just want you to, this should kind of be one of those messages that you go back and you think, yes, this is for the church, but it's also for me. I want to remember very carefully, because I remember the joy of sitting on the front row. Uh, it became, for me, where I had to work wearing an earpiece because I was directing on the front row because we had problems with directors and I was directing the video and talking to the soundboard and kind of managing everything and that was very joyous for me but then it became I wasn't able to sit and take copious notes because I used to enjoy just taking notes and listening to Dr. Scott sometimes shorthand sometimes wow what language is that and it went from that and I can, I can travel down the pathway to where I, now I'm, I'm working every Sunday. I'm not talking about what I'm doing now, because what I'm doing now I don't classify in the same category. But it became that for a time. But I remember what it was like. And then I remember what it was like when I first started in the pulpit. And it was, it was a challenge to me, because I didn't have the scriptural knowledge. And I didn't have, a lot of you had 20 and 30 years, I didn't have that. So the challenge of coming every single Sunday was not only daunting, I mean, it was at times downright scary because, you know, I've got to stand and at least try to be eloquent. And as you can see, once again, I've got a lectern full of notes and I'm just like a child. I just kind of put them all over and I say, okay, next. And I'll discard these. Okay, thank you very much. I could do that now. There was a time when I could not do that. And so I look back at all these things, but I remember... Repent, let's talk about this word repent, which we're taking from the Greek, not from the Latin, meta, with, and noia, mind. Repentance begins with this, the brain, the cranium, changing direction, going from my way, turning towards him and his way, his word, not repent as the Latin has it, that is with penitence over and over again. The mind is changing direction. The mind realizes. How many times have you read the passage about Jacob being transformed into Israel? But it took the mind, not just the body wrestling, it took the mind to realize, I am Jacob, I am heel catcher, I am supplanter. It took the mind and the mouth to articulate it for the Lord to finally say, and you are no more that. So the mind must be there. And then I put repeat because why? It says to do your first works. Do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly. That is an admonition right there. So what does that mean? It means get back to where you were. And how do you do that? How? I mean, I, I have preached Multiple messages on the prodigal son. And we tend to think, oh, well, that's that. I just told you about Psalm 51. You know how easy it is? And no, I think you do. I don't even think I have to allude to it. I know you know how easy it is to lose your faith grip, to get complacent, and to stop the things that you did when you first started. You know, Dr. Scott was so, he was so wise. And I, many of these things, they're self-evident, but I got them from him. When he said them, he only needed to say them one time, and it made sense to me. 
He said, why do we do for others? I remember when I met him, he said, why do we do for other people? Why do we do for complete strangers? We, we go the extra mile. We're more polite. We're more, well, I should say, for the most part, except when you're in your car. But, uh, <laughs> but why do we do for complete strangers? Why do we do more for people we don't know for no, than for those people that we supposedly love? Eh, let her deal with that. Let him, let, let him pick up the plates. Let, why do we do that? And I remember him saying that to me. It was very, it was kind of a, a, a moment of understanding how this man's mind worked. And I remember him saying to me, you know, if we ever get married, famous last words, if we ever get married, we're going to live in separate houses because that's the way I want it. <laughs> By the way, it didn't happen that way. Uh, but the logic of the way he thought was this is the besetting sin of most people. They get comfortable. They get complacent. And getting out of that comfort zone for people we supposedly should do more for. Now let's talk about the Lord. Let's talk about the love that you have for the one who saved you, who rescued you from absolute and certain doom. So I asked the same question with the same mindset. I just took it from fleshly and carnal now to spiritual. Why do we do more in other areas of our life? I'm not talking about works now. I'm talking about love. I'm talking about the love that keeps you connected, the love that never becomes complacent. And when you read Paul writing to the Corinthians in the 13th chapter, talking about love, love doesn't keep a record of wrongs, love, well, think about that. Stop thinking about it on, on the horizontal level and think about it on the God level looking down at us. Doesn't keep a record, doesn't puff itself up, isn't, and you begin to think of love in a different way. Somebody said to me just recently, and I have to clean this up because it had a couple of um, not nice words in it, but they said, you know, the people say love conquers all, and that's just a bunch of stuff. But the reality is the love of Christ conquers all, and because you have the love of Christ, because that love is there, all these other things are not mechanic. They are not on autopilot. If you think about this, lost love, I've heard commentators and I've read commentators say, this is lost love for one another, love of fellow, love of brother. No, this is first and foremost the love that got them started, which is why he says you go back and you do the first works over again. Repeat. Go back to square one and repeat. So somebody says to me, well, how do I get back to square one? I just told you. You can only get back to square one just like the person who's an addict, a drug addict, an alcoholic. I don't care what your addiction is. It's the same principle, by the way. Until you figure this out, you will go nowhere. Until you figure it out, the same principle with God, you will go nowhere. Until you are able to sit down and talk to God and say, Lord, I know that you know, just like Psalm 139. Lord, I know that you know my down sittings, my up risings, my thoughts of far. Lord, I know that you know my weaknesses. I know that you see my frailties. Lord, I know that you know all these things, but I'm going to sit down here and have an honest conversation about my state of mind, my state of affairs, because I need help. And I can't do it without you. I've been trying, Lord. I've been trying. Mechanically, I've been trying in the flesh, but I can't do it without you. Because I'm supposed to be with you, and you're supposed to be with me. I cannot do it by myself. Let me just tell you, how many people I've met who don't understand this and they, they, they just think, well, I'll, I'll stop it. I will. The, 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 the addict, the person who's fallen off the tracks with the Lord, I'll get back on. I'll fix it. No, you won't. You won't fix it until you do exactly what, what is said here. Remember where you were and how far you've fallen. If, you, if you're even, forgive me for using the L word, lucky enough to see that you've fallen that far, thus far. Change your mind. Turn from your way Back to him. You know where the direction is. You got the road map in front of you with this book. And do the first works. Go back to what you were doing at the beginning. Were you, were you praying more? Were you reading the Bible more? Were you having discussions under your roof? Your husbands, your wives, your kids. Were you talking about the word of God more? Were you talking to God and telling him that you need help? Or has it just become, this is a fruitless endeavor in silent, the silent treatment, because God's just giving me that. I'm just telling you, if you want the roadmap, this is where it starts. 
And I've given you at least one psalm to go and meditate on because that, that one psalm will lead you back to a clear path. David said it in the most succinct way. It's against the Lord you've sinned. You start there. And you ask the Lord to help you to get back. Now, there's, there's a, a second part to this. Failure to act on what is the exhortation leads to a very terrible alternative, which is what? Else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy, thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Now, the candlestick is only used for one thing. That's to illuminate. It's all you've got to think of. Don't, don't get mystical about it. Don't get crazy about it. Just to illuminate. I'll take, I will take the light away from you. And then there's another commendation here. This thou hast, thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And somebody says, God doesn't hate anything. Oh, yes, he does. He just said it right here. And who are these people? Are they followers of Nicholas, which some of the church fathers have proposed? Or the word itself is a cognate, Nico, from overcoming or conquering, and Laetans from the laity, the people, the overcoming or the conquering of the people, maybe those that lorded it over the people. Who knows? But he says, you've got this in your favor. You hate their deeds, and I also hate them. So there's certain things that God doesn't like. Just put that in, in the back of your mind. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. All I want to leave you with today, you know, you can read this and you could say, the book is a book of revelation. It's about, right now, we're talking about the churches. We're not talking about visions in heaven. We're not talking about things to come in earth. We're talking about the things that from that 119 that are now referring to this church. And it's very simple. To, to listen to what's being said says also at the same time to be able to hear what the Spirit is saying says there's a reward at the end of this. And each one of these churches has a reward. To each one that overcomes, this one is to eat of the tree of life. The book closes with a picture of the tree of life, which is for the healing of the nations. Remember, the book of Genesis has the tree in the beginning. I've told you, Genesis and Revelation are like the bookends, and in between is every, are all the happenings of humanity and the folly of not heeding the word of God and not listening to God's instructions. But very simply put, this is, I said this is why I wanted to go linear to show you something. You'll see in each one of these churches a description of Christ, a commendation, a rebuke, an exhortation, the alternative, and a reward, which tells me something. This, this one who is saying to you, John, write this letter and send it, very clearly, we are obviously this far down the road, recipients of this. The word should still be penetrating to us. And as I said, yes, could these apply to the churches through time? Absolutely. But I want it to apply to us. I want us to look at all this and understand if Christ had an issue with these people, even though he commends them and says, I know your work, I know your labor, and we're talking about this word for labor is to the point of weakness or, or, or failing something that is, has been squeezed out so long there's just about nothing left, and your endurance. There's the commendation. It's not all just a rebuke. But if the Lord is taking notice of this, he's also saying, I'm not wanting people to just go through the motions. There could be nothing worse in life than going through the motions of something. You go to a job, you go through the motions of going to your work because you have to work because you've got to work. But there's nothing worse than going through the motions of things and not having the reality of being, and I'm going to use a kind of yuppie term, being present and in the moment of what you're doing, and especially when it's regarding the Lord, to be connected to that one you and I say we want to spend eternity with. There could be nothing worse than going through the motions. Have I met people? Have I been in churches like that? Yes. Where here's the order of the service, this is how it's going to happen, and of course the Preacher comes and everything is nice, everything's ordered, all the notes are in order. And then we go, one, two, three, and everything's boxed in. There's no room for God to enter in and do anything because it's all, it's all been planned out, it's all been mapped out. That's mechanical Christianity. Mechanical Christianity is I have no joy in my life, I have no joy in serving the Lord, but I do it because I feel the sense of pressure that if I don't, 
You need to get back to that. And, and you cannot get back to it by saying, I will do this thing. You get back to it by going back and, and looking at where you were, just like the admonition. Remember, repent, and repeat. Go back to what you first did. And I guarantee you something. This church, obviously, if you are a curious mind, you'll go and you'll look online. If you've been there and you've seen, that's a place of ruins. And obviously, the fragments, the scattered fragments of any Christian church are scant. That tells you that something happened to not preserve. In other words, the candlestick indeed was taken away. Um, there, are no, there are no great structures that remain that say, this was the church, and here were the people, and this was the community. So there's something for us to kind of say, when the Lord says he'll do something, uh, he obviously did it. That was a bustling place of commerce. And as I said, with Paul there for two years and John there afterwards and Timothy, we know that there's a whole succession of people that came that taught, but eventually that church, the light was taken away. Now, I don't think, I'm not here to tell you a gloom and doom. The Lord's going to come and take away. I'm telling you, it's good for us to just take notice. If these are the words of the Lord, then I'm also going to say what the Lord instructs here if you have an ear, if you're able to hear what I'm saying, not my words, but the word of God and the spirit of God, even remotely, even faintly, then be glad and begin your journey afresh today. That's the beauty of, it's the beauty of the God that I believe I serve and I preach to you. He knows our frame. He knows that we mess up. He knows how incompetent we are to be trusted. I'm sorry, I'm speaking it just the way it is. We get giddy for a time or when we get super needy and then we become the grovelers. The, the quintessential need to be brought to your knees because the only way you'll come back to God and ask for something, right, in desperation. But he knows our frame and yet even in those moments he still lets you get up again and gives you another chance to start over. That's called the grace of God. And I can tell you, I've been a recipient of that grace. I can't even count. And I'm sure many of you listening to me and the sound of my voice have too. So let's take notice of what's being said. And instead of it just being something about Revelation and the church at Ephesus, let's make it something that gives us the confidence to go back, for some of us to reread Psalm 51, and for some of us to go back and begin to lean a little bit heavier in our prayer life, in our discussions, in the things that we really need to sustain us and keep us while we walk this pilgrim's pathway down here. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.